I'm going to demonstrate several networking options in VirtualBox, specifically Network Address Translation, or NAT, which is the default option, uh, Bridge Mode, and an internal network. And I've got uh, Ubuntu Linux servers already installed, and, and I'm going to use them. They're essentially equivalent, except uh, they've been configured with the different networking options. We'll go through NAT first. Just if we go to the settings in VirtualBox, we can see that under the network settings, the default is that an adapter is attached to NAT, or Network Address Translation. And this allows the uh, guest computer to have internet access from a client's perspective. It can access the real external internet, but generally uh, real devices on the internet cannot access this internal guest device. So this is normal for setting up a virtual machine for browsing for a client usage. The default settings are normally sufficient. Uh, we will see later that we can enable port forwarding so that external uh, hosts can access specific services on the guest. So let's just see that operating. If we start that node, uh, Note that it's already saved it in a start position, so uh, when we boot it up, we'll just log into this Linux node and I'll bring it across. And I'll just log in and get the right username and the password. And I'll just look at my IP address using ifconfig. And note in the second line there of the output, the internet address, the IP address, is 10.0.2.15. So this is the IP address that's been allocated to my guest. And how that actually works is that VirtualBox runs a DHCP server allocating uh, uh, IP addresses to the guests. Just to see the difference, so my host computer, my actual computer, I can either open the command prompt in Windows and run ipconfig and see my real IP address, the public internet address of my physical computer is 138.77.176.56 whereas the guest Linux machine when we use NAT gets an internal address. And it's set up such that the uh, real computer cannot, or internal external computers on the internet cannot access this uh, internal guest. Uh, just to see that we can have internet access from my Linux computer, the guest, I can access websites or I can ping uh, real computers. For example, if I ping Google, and we get a response. So I have internet connectivity, but external computers will not be able to connect between devices in VirtualBox and also to allow external devices to log in. And if I try to ping, uh, if I bring up my command prompt and ping my Windows computer in the background here, I've got a picture that shows the connectivity Noting that uh, the guest I list here is Kali Linux, but it's just a Linux guest in this case. My host computer is Windows 10, and I'm using NAT. So from the real internet's perspective, what happens is my host computer is allocated an IP address. In my picture, it's 1.2.3.4. In my real computer, it was the, uh, the 138.77.176.56 address. So that's the real address allocated to my computer. What VirtualBox does is it acts as a router and a DHCP server and also does network address translation. So when you start your guest, VirtualBox router acts as a DHCP server and allocates an IP address within some range defined by VirtualBox. In this case, 10.0.2.15 for my guest. Whenever that guest tries to communicate out to the internet, for example when I ping Google, it uses the source address of 10.0.2.15, but when it gets to the VirtualBox router, it implements NAT, which changes the address, translates it to the 
public 1.2.3.4 in this example. And when the response comes back, NAT does its job and forwards it back to the guest. Without port forwarding set up, no one on the internet can access my internal guest. We can enable port forwarding so specific services on the guest can be accessed from outside. The next mode of networking I'm going to show is bridged mode. So I have my second machine here, I'll start that up. Uh, actually before I start it, let's look at the settings. The network settings in VirtualBox, the adapter is set to be a bridged adapter. And we actually choose the, the real adapter on the host computer, in this case my Gigabit Ethernet adapter. If you're using Wi-Fi, then you may choose your Wi-Fi adapter. And what VirtualBox will do will bridge that adapter with the, the network interface in the guest machine. And again, the default settings are normally sufficient. So I'll start my guest and we'll have a look and see what happens with regards to the IP addresses. Remembering my host is with this 138.77.176.56 address, which is an IP address allocated by my real network DHCP server inside the university. So if I log in to this Linux machine, if we run ifconfig, we can see I have an interface, this EMP0S3 interface, and the second line shows the IP address, this 138.77.176.66 address. Noting my host, dot 56, my guest, dot 66. What's happened here is that with bridging mode, VirtualBox essentially uh, brings the guest network adapter onto the real network. So, and as a result, the real DHCP server in my uh, LAN has allocated an IP address to this guest uh, within the same network address as the host address, this 138.77.176 network address. Just to check, again with this mode, we essentially have full connectivity as the host does. So I can uh, ping, I have access to outside internet websites. And other devices on the network will be able to ping and, and contact my uh, guest device. So for example, I'm on my Windows host and I'm going to ping the address of the Linux guest 77.176 and the guest is dot 66 and it's talking, it's getting a reply. So we have connectivity from the uh, host to the guest because it's as if the guest is on the same network as the host. What's happening here with bridging, if I bring up a picture of this, we have our Ubuntu Linux guest, we have our Windows 10 host. The DHCP server for my real network has allocated my Windows 10 host, the IP address in this demo or in this example picture, 1.2.3.4. And what bridging does is it essentially joins that so that when the Ubuntu Linux guest sends out a DHCP request, it is forwarded on to the real LAN and the real DHCP server sends back a response and allocates an IP address, say 1.2.3.5 or the .66 address in my example. So it's as if we now have two computers on the real LAN, my Windows 10 host and my Ubuntu Linux guest. And with that, if we have multiple guests in VirtualBox, they'll be able to communicate with each other because they'll be all within the LAN and say the next one would be 1.2.3.6. It would be able to talk to the other guests as well as the host and other devices inside that LAN, other real devices. So this is much easier to allow networking amongst devices both inside VirtualBox and inside the same LAN. In theory, hosts out on the internet when we're using bridged mode can also contact the guest. 
However, in practice, it will depend upon your real network. If you're in your home network, your home router may block that. You would need to set up that router to allow external internet hosts to access the internet. So let's look at the third mode, which is similar to bridging, where we can set up a network and have the different VirtualBox machines communicate with each other, but a little bit more secure and that we don't use the host IP range, we have an internal network. So I've got another node here and what I'll do is also set that use the NAT node and set that to uh, talk to the Ubuntu Linux internal host. So let's look at the settings for this third Linux guest. We go to the network settings and I've set up the adapter to use an internal network. So not NAT, not bridge, but an internal network. And here you should choose a name of the internal network. And I've just called it demo net. The other settings are the default settings. The idea is that uh, all guests that you want to be able to communicate with each other, you can put them on the same internal network. And I'll do that in a moment for the, uh, the other NAT device. So let's start this one and see what happens. So it's not going to use NAT or bridging, it's going to just connect to an internal network which should allow it to communicate with other VirtualBox machines on that same internal network. Bring it across and it will boot up. So it doesn't necessarily have internet act uh, connectivity. And we're booting up. We'll wait for it. And we start to give this something being uh, slightly slow here. Start job is running for Ray's network interfaces and it says it's going to wait up to five minutes, five seconds. It's trying to set up, uh, automatically set up the network interface. Um, and because we're using internal networking, it's not going to be able to, so basically it's trying to get a DHCP uh, address from a server, that's not going to work because uh, we're using internal networking. So this is going to run for five minutes and then give up. So I'll just pause now and then we'll explain a way to overcome this problem for the next time. While that node is waiting that five minutes, uh, let's look at our other node. We'll look at the settings. This is the NAT uh, Linux node. Adapter 1, we're going to use NAT. I'll leave that. I'll use a second adapter, so a second network interface. I'll enable that and attach it to an internal network and make sure the name matches the one we gave for the other node. The idea is that uh, VirtualBox will set it up so that the this network interface is connected to a virtual switch, which is then connected to the network interface for our internal node. They'll be on the same LAN. So we can start that node. Noting that our uh, other one is still waiting that five minutes. So we'll boot this one and set it up as we wait for that. This one has NAT enabled as well on the second interface. Note there it has two interfaces. We'll see uh, more detail shortly. Uh, but the NAT one allows the uh, DHCP server to allocate an address. In this case, the vir VirtualBox DHCP server. So I'll log in. And we'll just look. We still have our internal address allocated by VirtualBox 10.0.2.15. But if we use ifconfig to see all interfaces with a minus A option, we see that there's another interface, EMP0S8, which has no IP address. This is the second adapter, which is going to be on the, the internal network demo net. It doesn't have an IP address. We would need to give it an IP address. And there are different ways to do that. One way, we can use the command line program ifconfig. Uh, another is using uh, the command line program IP and another is to configure it in a file so when your computer boots it automatically gets that. 
Let's use ifconfig as, as a quick way. I want to configure that interface p0sa. Uh, I want to give it an address and I'll just give it a 192 address 168.1.1 net mask. So I need to manually set a static address. And broadcast if we like, uh, but no, it'll come. And that interface is currently down, so I'll specify it to be up. That is, set, configure this interface to IP address 192.168.1.1 and turn this interface up or turn it on. And to do that, we'll need to be sudo or proceed the command with sudo. And it's asking me for my password. Note it gave an error there about sudo. That is because I've actually uh, changed the host name to natdemo without changing the, the corresponding file for that sudo looks at. So it's confused about netdemo because before it was just called demo. It's not an error, it's a warning. I have config. This second interface, EMP0S8, has an IP address 192.168.1.1. Uh, it should be attached to our demo network, our internal network, and we're going to use it to talk to the other Linux node once that's up and running. Let's see, did it get through the five minutes? Yes, it's gone through the five minutes. So let's log into that one and see A, how we can configure it so it won't have to wait for five minutes the next time and then get it to talk to our second Linux node. So I'll log in. I have config. Let's see what we currently have. We have a single interface. It has no IPv4 address because what happened it, uh, when the system booted, it tried to get an address using DHCP because we set up internal networking, that wasn't possible. It actually gets an IPv6 uh, uh, local scope, uh, a links, link scope address, so a link local address, which is just allocated um, when you don't get a DHCP uh, response. That's of no use to us, we want an IPv4 address. So we saw on the first node that we could set it using ifconfig. I'll show you another way which will also solve this problem of this five minute wait for the startup. And we need to edit a file. It's called, it's in the network, uh, it's in the folder or directory etc slash network. It is called interfaces. So I'm going to use the text editor vi to open the file called interfaces within the directory slash etc slash network and to edit this I need to be administrator so I need to proceed the command with sudo and ask for my password and this is the interfaces file and this is looked at when your system boots uh, I'll just quickly explain uh, what's here but not all the syntax the first these two lines are showing uh, to enable automatically enable the loopback interface. This is for localhost. This is for the uh, the first network adapter, which is uses is on the NAT uh, settings in VirtualBox. It's saying get your internet address using DHCP. So ask the DHCP server, and that one works. And oh, sorry. Uh, that one doesn't work on this Linux node, it works on the NAT one. So that's where our problem was. It's saying ask the DHCP server, but we have set up an internal network where it won't be able to connect to a DHCP server. So that's the problem here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to comment that out. I for insert and insert a hash there to come out those two lines. And I've already as you see, written the replacement lines. I'll explain them. What I want to replace uh, this setting with, instead of saying get the IP address from a DHCP server, I want to statically assign the IP address using this static option. 
and I specify in the next four lines the values I want to give it. The IP address, the net mask, the network address and the broadcast address. In that case, when the system boots, it will read this file, it will see uh, we don't need to ask a DHCP server, we statically assign the IP address and it won't wait for these five minutes to boot up. And of course I don't need to use ifconfig like I did in the other Linux node, I will automatically have this address. So let's try that, I'll uh, write that and quit and I'll reboot and let's hope it boots faster than the five minutes. Shuts down and then starts up again. Remembering the Linux node on the left has the IP address on the internal network of 192.168.1.1 and let's log in. See we didn't have to wait our five minutes there so we've avoided that problem by statically assigning address. And run ifconfig we have the address 192.168.1.11 in this case and they both should be configured to be on the same uh, virtual network or the same internal network which is our demo net. So let's see if they can talk to each other. So here we'll ping 192.168.1.1 and sure enough we get a response. So we can communicate between the two uh, VirtualBox guests and of course it should work. So with internal networking, we can use that to set up so the guests can communicate with each other, but they don't necessarily have internet access. Now our left-hand node, the NAT demo, does have internet access because it has two adapters. It has the NAT adapter and the internal network adapter. So we can still ping, say, Google. So we do have internet access as a client from the NAT demo Linux node, but from the internal only demo, if we try to ping Google, we get no response because this one only has a single adapter and all it knows about is the internal network. And we can see a little bit more detail if we look at the routing cable using the route on both nodes. On our internal only node on the right hand side, internal demo, it has a route or it knows about the network 192.168.1.0. It knows about its local LAN only and it can therefore only communicate with other uh, machines on that same local LAN. The NAT demo node also knows about 192.168.1.0 so it can talk to the internal only node, but it also has a route or a default gateway to 10.0.2.2, which is the VirtualBox uh, NAT router, which then forwards out to the real internet. So with the NAT demo, we can communicate with the internet. With the internal only demo, we can't at this stage. But we could configure the routing table inside the internal only node so that it is aware or it can go via say the gateway in uh, the NAT demo or we could enable the second adapter and how, allow it to have a NAT. So we've gone through three options of using NAT only on a Linux node to allow essentially client only access to the internet. Bridge networking where we have the guest having essentially client access to the internet plus communication with other nodes inside the virtual box and inside the, the real network. So we can potentially have other nodes accessing servers on the guest. And then we saw internal networking where we can have the virtual box guests communicate with each other. They uh, can have internet access if we also enable the NAT on the adapter we may need to do slightly more settings if we want to allow them to communicate with each other uh, and with nodes outside VirtualBox. Which one to use? 
If you just want a single node and you want to run it as a client, then probably NAT is sufficient. If you want a more complex virtual box network or a virtual network of nodes, then you may use bridge mode. It's probably the easiest to set up. If you want to be a little bit more controlled or secure, where you don't want uh, the internal nodes to have the same network address or the same IP address as on your real network, you may use internal node. But it does require some additional routes to be set up. With uh, NAT mode, hosts cannot access the guest unless we enable port forwarding. So let's, to finish off, look at port forwarding. So to demonstrate this, I'm going to use a secure shell server. So I'll install that. So I'm on my NAT demo node here. I'm going to install the uh, OpenSSH secure shell server. And what I want to be able to do is from my host machine, log in to the secure shell server. It looks like I may have installed it before. Uh, I'll shut down that and enable port forwarding. Actually, before that, we'll try and test. So I'm going to open up a secure shell client inside my host machine, my Windows 10 machine. And we can do that using, for example, PuTTY. And we'll open up PuTTY. And our IP address, uh, the problem being, if we try to connect to 10.0.2.15, which was the IP address of our guest, then from our previous settings, it doesn't work. We'll try. And I'm bringing it across. It's trying to connect from my Windows 10 host to 10.0.2.15, but in that mode, by default, uh, it cannot do that. So that's not going to resp respond. It will eventually uh, time out. I'll give that up. We need to establish port forwarding to allow that to work. Allow that to work. I'll power off my machine and then go to the settings and in network settings and our adapter under advanced we have the port forwarding option. And we'll add a rule here. We can give it a name. Uh, secure shell. The host secure shell uses TCP. What we need to set up and be careful with is the ports. So what I want to say, anything that goes to my uh, goes to my local host in a particular port, I want to redirect it to the the guest. So the guest port is 22 because I know secure shell servers run on port 22. The host port, I'm going to choose a different one. Um, generally, you can choose anything uh, as long as it's not used by other services on your host computer. I'm going to choose, let's say, 5022. And we'll show how that works. So that, for example, if I'm running a secure shell server on my host computer, there won't be any confusion. So redirect anything that goes to port 50222 to the guest port 22. So we have port forwarding set up. Actually, before I forget in port forwarding, we should also complete set the host IP. This is important. 127. That is a local host address saying if someone runs a secure shell client and connects to the actual local host, that is the, the Windows 10 host, and at port 5022, then redirect to the VirtualBox guest, uh, this particular guest, and redirect it to port 22. So include the host IP address there. And we'll start our machine. And while that's starting, we'll start PuTTY. And here we specify the localhost address. Basically, from my Windows client, I'm going to connect to the 
localhost, the Windows computer, but to a particular port, 5022, and it's actually VirtualBox that's listening on that port, and VirtualBox knows, because we enable port forwarding, anything that comes in on port 5022, send it to the guest, the NAT demo guest, and to port 22. Let's make sure our node is up and running. That is, and let's open that. And I'll just bring this across. It's come up on my other screen. It comes up with a warning saying, I'm not aware of that. Do I really trust it? Yes, we really trust it. And now party's come in as the login. So it's actually logged us in now, or, or sorry, it's connected us. Now we log in. And I'm on NAT demo. So this allows uh, nodes, my, in this case my Windows 10 host, to connect to a server on my Ubuntu Linux guest. And in theory, anyone out on the internet can connect to my Ubuntu Linux guest. In practice, your, say, home router, or in my case, my university LAN router, would most likely block people out on the internet accessing the internal network. But from my uh, Windows 10 host, I can log in and um, as if I'm sitting at the computer. So port forwarding allows uh, spe specific cases where we can access the guest from outside. So now you can choose from the different options for setting up a, a network, depending on whether you want to run a single simple node, you may use NAT, possibly with port forwarding. If you want to run multiple nodes, you may use bridged or internal networking. Uh, and you may still use port forwarding if, if needed. I'm going to create an internet within VirtualBox. And this simple internet is going to contain three Linux machines, our client, router, and server. The client and router will be on this single LAN, which we'll refer to as Net A, and the router and server on a second LAN, referred to as Net B, and of course the router connects those two LANs together. All of the IP addresses on these uh, machines within this internet are going to start with 192.168 to keep things simple. So for example, client's going to be 192.168.1.11, server 192.168.2.22, and the router has two interfaces, one to net A, one to net B, and therefore we'll have two IP addresses, 192.168.1.1, 192.168.2.2. That's what we want to achieve. However, we have to do a few other things to get it working inside VirtualBox so that these three machines can also access the real network or the real internet outside of VirtualBox. So let's have a look at VirtualBox, see what I've got set up and create this network. I already have a, a Linux-based machine installed in VirtualBox and it's been set up, I've set up the, I've done the full install of Linux and if I just look at my settings, my properties, from memory it's 1604.3 LTS but I did an upgrade so it's actually Ubuntu Linux 1604.4. I've installed a bit of software including Open Secure Shell Server, some man pages and Nano, very basic setup and it's using the default network settings which is NAT. So just the default settings for a Linux machine. What we're going to do is use that as the base, clone it three times to become the client, router and server, and then we'll change the network settings and introduce new adapters for each of those new machines. So to clone, we'll take that and we'll give the new one called instead of base client and reinitialize the MAC addresses so that will get new ones, a full clone, current machine state. So you can have your own base machine and then make three clones of it. It takes some time to copy the disk. This will be the client. And we have the client machine, same settings, and let's just do it quickly for the router and server. 
and I'll reinitialize the MAC address so they all get different MAC addresses and then we'll set up the uh, additional network adapters. The idea is that we'll use the normal NAT interface to allow each of these machines to connect to the real network and then we'll use uh, an internal interface to allow them to connect to each other in their internal virtual internet. And the last one we'll call server and let that climb. So this is the internet we want to build but what it's going to look like is this. The uh, dash box around the outside is my computer, my Windows computer and it's running VirtualBox. I'm going to have the three uh, Linux machines, client, router and server, running inside VirtualBox. They each have a NAT interface inside VirtualBox. So that's already configured and if we look internally they get an address 10.0.2.15 and the way that they access the real internet is they send packets to VirtualBox. VirtualBox uses network address translation to convert them to my real IP address for example 1.2.3.4 or that of your computer and sends it to the real internet. I would like each of these machines to have continued access to the real internet so that they can for example do updates of software, install software and so on. Just for management purposes. But for testing and deploying my internet, my virtual internet inside VirtualBox, I'm going to have the three talk to each other so I'm going to set up additional adapters. For example, the client has an adapter using NAT and an additional internal network adapter which is going to connect to network A. The router will have an adapter connected via NAT that comes by default, plus two additional internal adapters connected to network A and network B. So let's do that in VirtualBox. It's quite easy, we go to the settings network we already have the NAT adapter that can stay on the client we add a second adapter enable that and select internal network mine's already selected here make sure it's internal network and i will call my network a advanced settings can stay as they are make sure cable is connected but by default that should be okay this is saying that my uh, linux node when it boots up is going to have really two interfaces one that connects to the real internet via NAT and one that's going to connect to this virtual LAN called NET A. Okay that. For the router we want the NAT adapter plus two internal adapters. Be careful here. Make sure you use the same network name. For example on the router one of the adapters connects to NET A and the other one, which we enable, internal network, and that's connected to network B. Okay, that, and on the server, we'll need to set up the network adapter, the second one, to connect to internal network B, in that case. Client and router connects to network A. Router and server connects to network B. And when we run them, VirtualBox creates these LANs inside VirtualBox, are virtually created, uh, and, and maintains them so that the client will be able to directly talk to the router as if they're on the same LAN. And the router directly to the server, again on a second, separate LAN. The client will not be able to talk directly to the server on a LAN, but later we will configure so that they can communicate via the router. To get an internet. So we need to do a few things to set them up. So I'll start each of those nodes and then we'll uh, set them up inside Linux so that we can have that internal network and we'll enable some routing. So I'll boot those up and then we'll come back and see them running. So I have my three Linux machines running. In the top left I have my client running and I'm logged in as Steven 
and it's still got the hostname base. So let's change that. So sudo hostname control or CTL set hostname to, in this case, I'll just call it client. And enter my sudo password. And I'll also edit the host file, sudo vi slash etc slash hosts. And change from base to client in there. And we'll do the same on the other two, change from base to router and base to server. We'll just quickly do that. This one's client, escape, colon, wq. And when we reboot, we'll see that come up. I'll just we'll exit and we see we have client there. And I'll log in just so we have a, a different name. And I'll do that quickly. Hostname CTL set hostname to router. My password and also edit it in that etc slash hosts file and insert either insert and change that to router colon sorry escape colon wq exit exit Stephen student. We have our router and the last one for the server. Hostname control set hostname to server. And edit the host file and insert server. Escape colon right quick exit. All right we now have names which make more sense than base. Uh, in my case I've included on these a file which just keeps track of what I've done on them. Uh, I've put it in a readme file in mine just to remind myself I've installed OpenSSH server, man, man pages, man page dev. These give me some extra man pages for some things uh, that I may want to look up later and nano if I want to use that. I've done an update and an upgrade. So uh, it's bringing me into the latest versions of the software and I've just done the hostname setting. Okay, so let's have a look at our current interface configuration. This is on the client and it shows me I have one interface EMP0S3 internet address 10.0.2.15. This is the NAT interface and this is enabled and you'd see that's the same on each of the, the three machines. But I have enabled a second interface or adapter but it's not yet on so I use the minus A option in ifconfig and it'll show me all interfaces. We'll see it scroll through the first one EMP0S3 is there but now we also see EMP0S8. This EN refers to an Ethernet adapter. P0S8 is the, the name given by the operating system. Yours probably is the same, but be careful if it's different. Adapt the instructions later to use the correct one for your machines. My EN P0S8 is an internal interface, and I'm going to use that to connect direct to the router via network A. So I'll need to set it up to uh, give it an IP address. And there are different ways to do that. And I'm going to edit a file on the operating system such that whenever this, the, this client boots, it gets an IP address that I give it. And the file which I'll edit with VI is in the etc directory under the network subdirectory. It's called interfaces. It's a text file. Uh, it's read when your system boots. And it has some configuration. Importantly, it uh, configures the loopback interface for communicating with yourself. EMP0S3 is configured to use DHCP. We need to add another entry in here to configure EMP0S8. And to get it to work, uh, we're going to set an IP address, our 192.168.1.11 address. Note that the network address is 192.168.1.0 
and we're going to have a corresponding broadcast and, and net mask to, to match that. So we're going to set that in the file. So I'm going to start ent entering that. Give it a comment. The internal interface for net A. And auto ENP0S8, which I saw from ifconfig. Interface ENP0S8. Internet interface. Let's make it static. So it, we statically assign an IP address. We don't get an IP address from DHCP. The auto line says automatically configure this interface when the system boots. And the next lines are going to tell us the static configuration. I'll just indent. We give it an address. 192.168.1.11 I've chosen. You can choose other addresses, but this is just for the example. And then we give it some other information, and I often forget. And if we go to the unit website, I've added the instructions on the task networking virtual box, an example that contains this information under configuring ETC network interfaces. This text file contains the example code to put in here. So you can look at it and uh, I'll open in Notepad++ and see exactly the, the syntax that's necessary. So we, we're doing this part of code right now. This is for the client. Also down the bottom is the code or the, the command configuration to give for the router and the server. So we set an address, an IPv4 address, a net mask, a network address, broadcast address, and then two special routes, which we'll see. So let's do the net mask, network, and broadcast address. Tab, net mask. And it's important to be careful here not to make mistakes, otherwise your network won't work. And to get started, you can use the exact same values. 192.168.1.255, the broadcast address. And that's normally enough. Except we need a, an additional configuration to handle the fact that in our client, we have two interfaces. The idea is that when we want to connect to the real internet, we'll send via ENP0S3. When we want to connect to anyone on the internal virtual internet, we'll send to ENP0S8. And to force that to happen, we'll add some routes for this interface, saying whenever we want to send to anyone on the 192.168 network, which includes the router and the server, send to the router at 192.168.1.1. So we're going to add a route specifically so when the client wants to communicate internally, it will send to the router. And the way that we do that is we can set the route using this command. And this will be set when the interface comes up. So after it comes up, we'll add the route. And if the interface is turned down, before we turn it down, pre-down, we want to delete that route just to make things clean. So we'll add these two lines saying add a route to reach any network 192.168.something, send to 192.168.1.1 via ENP0S8. This is a little bit of a trick so that we can have our node running using the inter internal network and also using the real internet using NAT. Post up route add dash net. 192.168.0.0 net mask 255.255.255.0 that's wrong dot zero dot zero gateway 192.168.1.1 device emp0s8 and the same pre down if we turn the interface down route delete the net the route in table entry 255.255.0.0 gateway all the same except instead of add is delete 
device EMP0S8. If you noticed your interfaces had a different name or number, not EMP0S8, you would need to change it here. That's all we need for the client. We'll do similar for the router and the server. So I'll escape and save that. And just to show it, So you can download the file to see what the exact configuration go in yours uh, and you could even copy and paste if you're using PuTTY. <clears throat> and I will do it for the router, sudo vi and I will cheat a little bit, let's use nano. Same file. We add in the internal interface for net A and from the example here it's almost the same except we don't need these special routes. The router in our simple network where we only have two subnets, the router is connected to both of those subnets, net A and net B, so it don't, we don't need routes to other subnets. It's only the client and server we need these special uh, pre-up and post-down routing commands. So it's quite simple for the router, except we need to configure two interfaces. Uh, and I'd better go back and just check. I'll save that. I have config minus A. I have the normal EMP0S3, which is the NAT interface, but I also have S8 and S9, because remember I had two internal interfaces, so we need to configure both of those. S8 I'm going to set to 1.1 for network A and S9 I'm going to set, and there's a mistake, I'll update that on the website, I'm going to set to 2.2. So when you see this video you should see that this is 9 not 89. So let's do that now. Auto EMP0S8 oh, I face EMP0S8 INET static address net mask network address broadcast is 192.168.1.255 and for the second interface it's almost the same I'll cut that and hope someone picks out my spelling mistakes you need to be real careful here because typos will mean your network won't work broadcast but this one's P not, at S9 and the address is 2.2 network 2. So that should do for our router. And I'll save that. And the last one for the server, almost the same as the client, but it's going to be 2.22. And the route that we'll add is to gateway 2.2, .2, which refers to the router and the same device. So we'll do that quickly with a server. And just to check, I have config minus A, EMP0S8. Edit our file. The primary, uh, sorry, the internal interface on net B. And you may realize I forgot to change that on the router. Yep. This is just a comment, so it wouldn't make any difference, but just to be clear, I'm configuring on the router one interface for network A and one for network B. And here, auto EMP0S8, interface EMP0S8, auto automatically configure it, internet interface, static configuration, address, 
is 192.168.2.22. I've just chosen that. You can choose another one, but it should be in the 192.168.2. range if we have the other settings. Netmask 255.255.255.0. Network 192.168.2.0. And broadcast 2.255. And we will add these post up route, add a route, network 192168, any 192168. We could have been specific and said 192.168.1.0, but this is general, so we could potentially add other networks, 192.168.3.0, but I don't think we will in this year. 0.0, .0 and we'll just Make sure we get this correct. GW for gateway or router 168.2.2 device EMP0S8. And the second line is about the same, but it's pre-down before the interface goes down. Delete the route. What these two lines are saying is when the, before the interface comes up, add a route, then bring the interface up. And if you turn the interface down or off, before you do that, delete that route, just so the routing table is consistent with the, the use of the interface. And we'll exit that. So that should almost be there. What I'm going to do is reboot those machines and then we'll see them come up and see if they can communicate with each other on the internal network sudo reboot and I'll do that for each sudo reboot and sudo reboot okay I've rebooted I've logged in here's our test can they talk to each other via these internal interfaces and to talk to each other I'm just going to ping to get started and let's just look at the interfaces on the client we have the just to see it, P0S3, the NAT interface, which for the internal communications we'll not use. But PSS, P0S8 has now the IP address 192.168.1.11. That's been configured based upon that interfaces file when the system boots. And the router should have EMP0S8 for network A and also S9 for network B and for the server emp 0 s 8 2.22 so they've been configured with their IP addresses let's see first see if we can ping from the client to the router on the same network net A 1.1 is the router Good, we can ping from client to router. Alright, and the router has two IP addresses, 1.1 and 2.2. .2. Yep, okay, that makes sense because if we can talk to one of them, the router should be able to respond to either. Now the real test of our internal internet is whether we can talk from client to server via the router. Ping the server, 2.22. It's not working. We're not getting a response, so I'll control C to quit. There were seven packets transmitted, zero responses came back. We've got one more step to do. We were trying to ping from client to the server via the router, although our routing tables are set up, and we can check the route. Uh, just to clear things out, the Minus N shows us the raw numeric addresses and that's better to use rather than get the domain addresses because sometimes the domain will be wrong. So the routing tables, if we look close, we have a route to 192.168.0.0 to go via the router. However, and that's from the, uh, the pre-up configuration. Our problem is we haven't really we haven't configured the router Linux node to act as a router. 
What a router does is forwards packets. And by default, our Linux nodes are uh, hosts which don't forward packets. So we need to, as the last thing, configure our router to be a router. We can't just call it a router, we have to configure it. And we actually, to do that, we must tell it to forward packets, forward IP packets. Different ways to do it. One way we'll do it is so that we will maintain this status when we re reboot. Edit a file called syscintl.conf in the etc directory. Sorry, sudo vi slash etc sysctl.conf system control configuration file and it's got a lot of things commented out you can read through the one that we want it's scroll down a bit it's called IP forward here it is net IPv4 we're dealing only with IPv4 at this stage IP forward it's commented out commented out meaning it's not set we want to delete that comment character, the hash at the start, such that IP forwarding equals one, meaning IP forwarding is on in the router. That essentially turns our Linux machine from a host to a router. So just remove that hash at the start of this line and escape, colon, right, quit. And there's another way to do it dynamically. I'm just gonna reboot just to check and I'll reboot that machine and when it boots up it becomes a true router where it will forward packets and then I should be able to ping from client to server via the router and I'll get ready get our ping from client to 2.22 our router is booting I'm not even going to log in it's booted and there we go we're pinging from client to server, noting the TTL is now 63. If we ping from client to router, the TTL is 64. The TTL keeps track of the number of routers we go through. So when we're going direct to the router, it's 64, the initial value. When we go via one router, it's 64 minus one, that is 63, indicating we're communicating from client to server via router. Our last test, let's log in from client to server using Secure Shell. It asks you, do you really want to trust this? We're not sure if it's a man in the middle attack. Well, it's our own internal network. We know what's happening. So yes, I trust. Ask me for my password on the server. And now I'm logged into the server. Stephen at server, I have config, this is 2.22. So we have, we have our internal internet working. We can communicate from client to router and, and a server. And you can use this configuration to build your internal network. You could have multiple servers here, a web server, secure shell server, simply duplicate the server and give it a different IP address. Most other settings should be the same. And the thing is, with the NAT connections, these machines can also talk via the real internet. And to test that, I'm on my server. Can we ping Google? Yes, we can still ping the real Google website. So that's useful if you want to do a pseudo apt install of some software on any of those machines. We can go via the real internet. But for testing of our virtual network, we can use the internal internet. As long as they're in the 192.168 range, that should work. That allows you to set up an internal network using VirtualBox and our Linux machines. I'm going to demonstrate setting up the Apache web server inside some Linux machines on VirtualBox and including setting up uh, HTTPS and the use of digital certificates. So currently I have running three Linux machines in VirtualBox, a client, a router, and a server. I'm going to install Apache on the server and then use the client to test uh, web browsing on that. There are many different instructions online. We're using Ubuntu 16.04. 
uh, one set of instructions for setting up uh, Apache on Ubuntu. The DigitalOcean has some basic instructions so you can browse through there to see uh, the steps. They are quite uh, simple to set up Apache. It's a little bit more complicated to set up the digital certificates. So let's go through it and I have my window for my server here, a basic Ubuntu install. The first thing we're going to do is install using apt Apache. And it's actually Apache version 2, so sudo apt install Apache and I have my password and it asks me uh, do I really want to continue? There's a, a bunch of software that's going to be installed and yes I'm going to continue and it will download and install Apache and set it up and in fact the web server will be up and running once this completes. And I'll bring up my client and my client is connected to the server via router and for that we're going to use a, a text-based web browser so I'll actually to just to test install links. Links is a, a simple text-based web browser uh, and it's useful for quick testing when we only have the command line. So we can run links and specify the URL and in this case we're going to use the IP address of the server and I'll run ifconfig on the server and in my internal network the IP address is 192.168.2.22 so that's the address I'll connect to and it brings me to the Apache 2 default or Ubuntu default page the this is the page served by Apache by default. If you want to set up a website, you need to change those, uh, this index.html file and set up all your files in the appropriate directory. So it's up and running, that was simple. Uh, there's a couple of things we'll need to do to make it a little bit more convenient, but before we do that, uh, there are many directories relevant to Apache for setting it up on the server. I will not explain them all now. The uh, different documentation will explain them. For example, if we scroll through, we can see uh, this explains the default web page, which we saw, but only the text version. And in step five here, it talks about the different directories which are relevant and files for configuration of the Apache server. For example, var www.html stores the actual web content a lot of the configuration of the server are under the etc apache2 directory. I will not go through those now, we'll look at setting up a few other features in the server so we can test them. One thing of course what we did to access with a client is, <clears throat> and I'll just quit out of links using Q, yes I'm going to quit, we needed to supply the IP address, which is not much fun. Sometimes we'd like to use a domain name. In my small internal network, I don't have a DNS server, but I can cheat a little bit by manually setting mappings of domain names to IP addresses, in particular on the client. And one way I can do that, I'm on the client, is I edit a file called etc slash hosts. And I could insert a mapping in here. Insert the IP address of the server, and we'll say let's create a domain name for our server. So this says on my client, if I ever try and access www.example.com, it'll be redirected to 192.168.2.22, which is my actual web server. So this is our local version with respect to the client of a DNS settings. We can add more in here uh, to the same IP address or to other IP addresses if we have them on our internal network. And this is only for the client so we can in effect use any domain name that we choose. I'll save that, escape, write and quit. What that means is we can now use links but we can specify 
the domain name. And my local host file will map that to the actual IP address of the server. And we get the same web page. So that's useful for testing when we want to test with domains and it's only in our internal network inside VirtualBox. Quit out of that. So that's it. We can, we've installed the Apache web server and we can uh, access that from a client. So now let's go back to our server and have a look at, in a bit more depth about the configuration. And again, the website here lists the different directories and files of relevance. So we'll go through some of those, not all of them. This is on the server first. If we change into var www.html and ls, we see this is where the web pages are stored. And we can have subdirectories, images, and so on in here. So this is the web content in this directory. And it's got a, a, a default um, template web page which says welcome to Apache on Ubuntu. The Apache to Ubuntu default page. So when we create a website, we'll put our files inside here. The next directory of relevance, and I'll just clear and go to the top, is Apache 2 under the etc directory. And the main configuration of the web server is done via files within this directory, and they're primarily text files. And there's uh, multiple files, usually configuration files, entering in .conf, and there's further files or, or modules in some of the subdirectories. The first one, or the main one, is apache2.conf. We will not make any edits to it. Uh, you can browse through and read some of the comment, uh, some of the, the how it works, comments. But the com the main idea is that the web server is configured by directives. For example, although this one's commented out, the server root is the the parameter, and the value given here is etc Apache two. If you want to change those values, you can remove the hash at the start and modify them. This file, initially, we don't need to modify. The, the default parameters are sufficient. But if you really want to optimize or, or specialize Apache, you may go into here and change some parameters. And it refers to other files, including ports.conf and files available in the subdirectories. There's links into those. One of them, which is uh, of relevance, is in the sites available subdirectory. And it's the default configuration of Apache web server, and it's named 00default.com. And we'll open that up. And note it's read only. We'd need to use sudo to make changes to that. At this stage, I'm just viewing the, the configuration file. Here is where you're more likely to make the first configuration changes to your web server. For example, server admin gives the email address of the administrator. It defaults to an app local host, but if you have a real domain, you would put the real email address of the admin here. And it specifies where the root of your web directory is. And that can be changed, of course. Uh, the location of error logs, uh, access or custom logs, and that's it in this case. And this is uh, in this virtual host set of directives. We can actually have on the same physical server multiple virtual hosts or multiple different websites for different domains. We'll see that there's another file in here, this default ssl.conf. This is the configuration for setting up HTTPS, which we'll go to shortly. We'll come back and we'll need to edit that file. Apache. Uh, has extra features which are available in modules and the mods available list some of those modules currently in, uh, installed and there are different ways to enable those modules. We will enable the SSL module at a later stage. The other directory is the of, of uh, initial interest is where the logs are stored and that's under var log and 
There's a lot of operating system and software logs in here. The one of interest is Apache 2 subdirectory. And there's normally an access.log and an error log. And the access log is one of, of interest. It logs by default all accesses to the website. And it logs it in a, in a standard format where it keeps a record of who accessed the website at what date and time, what page they or uh, a path name they tried to get, and the response, the HTTP response code 200, the response size, and some information about the, the browser that accessed the website. We'll see over time as uh, multiple people access the website, this log can be quite useful for learning about how people access it. The error log is useful if there's things that go wrong in your web server. <clears throat> so they're the main locations where you get started with configuring uh, Apache. We're now going to set up uh, Apache to support HTTPS. So web browsers can connect to it in a secure manner using HTTPS. And it's not too hard to enable that on Apache, but the, the more complicated procedure is making sure Apache has a valid digital certificate. In the normal procedure, in a real server, what we would do is create a certificate for our server and then go to an external certificate authority to get that certificate uh, uh, signed. However, when we're using our internal network in VirtualBox and we want to do everything inside VirtualBox, we are not going to go out to an external authority. Instead, what I'm going to do is I'm going to create my own authority on my server and get that to sign the certificate for my web server. So I'm going to go through the steps of uh, creating a certificate for the authority, generating the authority, and then we'll create a certificate for the server and get the authority to sign that. So the first step here is creating a certificate for the authority. And I'm not going to explain the details of the algorithms like RSA and even the, the, how certificates provide security. That should be covered in a, a separate security unit. We're going to use common software for security operations called OpenSSL and it provides all the features we need to generate certificates, generate the authority, and sign certificates. And the mode we're going to use is we want to generate a public key pair for our authority, and we're going to use the algorithm, which is common, which is RSA. And I'm going to choose two options for the RSA algorithm, and the public key opt First one is the RSA, when we generate a key pair, the length is important. Normally we can choose between 1024 bits, 2048 or 4096, where the longer, the more secure, although the slower it is to do uh, operations, crypt cryptographic operations that is. Another option that I'm going to choose is in RSA, it has a, uh, a public exponent. And I'm going to choose it to be this magic value 65537. And really, you need to go and study the details of the RSA algorithm to understand the significance of the public exponent and what the bits, the 2048 bits, refer to. But this should generate our key pair and I'm going to output that key pair to a file. And this is my key pair for the certificate authority. So I'll call the file CA key. And the file format we use is .pem, PEM. And there it's generated a, a key pair. And we could go away and have a look at the details of that. Uh, for now, we'll leave it. We'll see uh, another example later. That's our certificate authority key pair. When you set up a server in the real case, you would normally not need to do that. You would go to an external CA, but we need to do it internally here. Now my authority needs to sign their own certificate. 
Again, not a normal step that we'd need on a web server. It would be done by an external authority. And what we do is we generate a request using a uh, standard X509. As an input key, we're going to use our cakey.pm and we're going to output a file called cacertificate.pm and I'm going to say this certificate is going to be valid for three years, 1095 days. This is actually the certificate authority is going to sign their own uh, certificate. And what have I done wrong? A typo here, I forgot a dot ca key dot pem. Note, I see this error opening, there's some error here, so be careful if you do see an error, you've probably got a typo like I did there. And this is the preferred, this is the success here. It now asks for information about my certificate authority. Country name or country code, Australia. State. And choose the one that's relevant for you. City, Cairns, organization name. This is for the certificate authority and essentially for the demo. You can choose whatever you like or use a university. Organizational unit, it's optional. I'll give the value certificate authority, but you could just press enter to skip that part. This is important, the common name, especially in a later step. Uh, normally it's a domain name, so I'll make up one for cqunie.edu. And a made up email address. I say made up because again, it's just internal to my VirtualBox network. I'm not gonna be using this on the real internet, so it doesn't matter here. And that should be done. And I now have the key pair, the RSA key pair for the certificate authority and a self-signed certificate for the authority, which is going to be needed later. Now we're still setting up the authority. The next thing we need to do is set up some directories so that this authority can sign the web server certificate. And I'm going to quickly go and set up the directories. So I'm in my home directory, just make sure, CD home. And the directory structure here is quite important. Uh, if you get the, the directories wrong, then you'll have problems later. So the directory name comes from a configuration file. You could change it, but it's best just to follow these directory names. I'm going to make a directory called demo CA. And then I'm going to make a few directories under that called certs, another one called CRL, and new certs. And these are needed, all of them are needed for our certificate authority. Private. And I need an empty file, so I'm going to touch a file in that, that directory called uh, index.txt. And I need another file and it must contain the value 02. Sounds like some magic values, but it's all necessary so our certificate authority will have the necessary files set up to be able to sign and issue certificates for our web server. And I'll echo that into the serial file. And I'm going to move the CA cert file that we previously created into the demo CA directory and move the CA key file, our key pair, into the demo CA private directory. You need to go through those steps to prepare our certificate authority. And the last step to prepare is to make a small change to a configuration. There's a file which we're going to edit as sudo using by, it's called user lib or usr lib ssl open ssl conf. This is the configuration for open ssl and in there is some settings that we're just going to change. 
We're looking for the settings which are to do with the CA policy and policy match. So scroll through. In fact, this specifies um, the default settings for all those directories that we just created. If you wanted to have different directories, you'd have to change this first. Look through, scroll down for the CA policy, for the CA policy and policy match. The first three lines are saying when the certificate authority signs a web service certificate, they must match in terms of country name, state and organization name. Well, I'm going to be a little bit more free and allow uh, the state and the organization name to be optional. That's what I want to change to optional here. Saying that my certificate authority will only sign certificates which come from the same country, but they can come from a different state and a different organization. So let's change those two to optional. The rest should be okay. And I'll save that. Now our certificate authority should be ready and we have the demo CA directory set up. Don't touch that. When we sign certificates, there'll be that'll be automatically updated by OpenSSL. So that was setting up the certificate authority, which would normally be done externally. You wouldn't need to do that. The next steps are for the web server creating a key pair for the web server and a certificate request for the web server, giving that certificate request to the authority and the authority will issue us a certificate. And these are the steps that you would need, normally need to do for your web server. Again, for the web server now, we need to create a key pair for the server. Generate the key, public key pair, same algorithm, RSA, same options in fact. PK option RSA, sorry, uh, RSA key gen bits. We'll use the same length, 2048. It doesn't have to be the same length as the, as the CA. And we'll use the same, let's get the syntax right, PK opt, same option for the public key exponent to be this magic 65537. This public key exponent, by the name public, everyone can know this, so it doesn't matter if we, if other people know it's this value 65537. It, everyone can use the same value, it doesn't create any security issues. And we're going to output that to a file, and I'll call it my private key. And I'm going to set up the server and give it a domain www.example.com. So that's what I'll name the file. So I remember this is the private key for www.example.com. If I wanted to host multiple servers or multiple websites on this one server, I could generate multiple private keys for different domains. And that's generated the private key. Now what we do is we generate a certificate signing request with OpenSSL, a request for a new, and the key that we're going to pass in is the one we just created, and we're going to output a certificate request for that same domain, and call that extension .csr for certificate signing request. This takes part of the private key, in, in particular the, the, the public key, and or takes the public key from the key pair and puts it into a format that we can deliver to the certificate authority, which will then issue us our certificate. And it asks for the similar information as the, when we did it for the um, certificate authority. Remember we set up the authority so that we need the same country name, but not necessarily to the same state. But I have them. And I'm going to call mine example company. And I don't want a unit, but this is important. The common name must be your domain name that you're going to use for your website. I'm using www.example.com. In your demo, you can use another one. 
but importantly when you set up your web server in Apache you must use the same one and uh, let's say webmaster at example.com for an email address that's not important here it's asking do you want to have some extra protection on this no we don't just press enter we don't want a challenge password and I don't want an optional company name that generates this certificate request what we do now is we send that to the certificate authority they will do some validation check that it's actually us and then issue a certificate if all is okay in real life that would be say sent to a, an external CA or uploaded to the website of a CA and some checks would take place in our internal virtual network the CA is on our server so we don't actually have to send it we can directly access it when we become the certificate authority so that's what the web server needed to do now I'm going to switch hats and imagine I'm now the certificate authority what I do I take that certificate signing request and again using OpenSSL as a certificate authority I take that as an input and I output a certificate I issue the certificate So this is the role of the certificate authority which we need just inside our virtual network. Do we want to sign the certificate? We should check that values and make sure it's valid. Yes, I do. Uh, you want to commit this to your database which updates the demo CA directory? Yes, I do. Database updated. That's good. And the thing that we need here is this certificate file that's the one which is issued to our web server uh, when I set up the web server in a bit more depth soon I'm going to also need the certificate authorities certificate which we actually before put inside demo CA so I'm going to copy that and I'm going to get a copy I'm, I'm going to rename it just so I'm clear it's a certificate for our CA that is the CA or certificate authority that signed our server certificate a little bit different uh, it's the same it's a .pem file but I'm going to refer to it as a .crt file just to distinguish it when we set up Apache we'll see where and that's it in terms of generating these certificates the next steps will be to set up Apache to use these certificates just before we proceed to make sure that everything's gone okay we'll use OpenSSL to verify as the using the certificate of our certificate authority to verify the certificate of our website and this should present that the certificate is okay good if you get okay everything's can uh, you can continue if you don't get okay then probably one of the steps you've done is is had a mistake prior to this just to summarize we were going to need in the next steps our certificate of our website and the certificate of our certificate authority and we'll use them when we set up Apache to support HTTPS so now let's uh, configure Apache to support these and use these certificates so we need to put these certificates first the web server certificate in directories which Apache are going to read by default and in fact I need to do this as sudo because the directory is under etc which is only writable by administrator and the subdirectory is SSL and under that there's a directory called certs for certificates so this is if you have multiple websites this is where you put the certificates of your web uh, sites uh, similar we need to also put the certificate of the CA our CA in that same directory and finally the private key of our web server under the etc SSL private directory 
So those are the three files, the uh, certificate of our web server, the certificate of our CA, put them into the cert subdirectory, and the private key of our web server into the private subdirectory. They are all needed by Apache. That private directory should uh, be protected because a private key, as the name suggests, must be kept private even from other people on this computer. And if we look in ETS, ETC SSL, the search directory is readable by all, the private directory is not readable by all. Okay, so that there's some protection. It's executable by this special group called SSL cert. You may want to change that, those permissions for uh, the file you just put in there to be more protected. But at this stage, it's sufficient for what we need in our demo. Okay, so we put the files so they'll be available to Apache. Now we need to configure Apache to uh, uh, use HTTPS. We'll go into the configuration directory and just clear that. And we'll go into sites available. And recall there are two configuration files. One is for normal HTTP, this default.conf, and another one if we want to use SSL or HTTPS on our web server. And it's this second one we need to configure or we need to uh, modify. So I'll open that up with my editor. It has a default configuration. We just need to change a few settings in there. The first thing we'll do is we'll insert a server name. And ours, I'm going to put in my domain name here. And the port number, which is used by HTTPS 443. So insert your server name if you've got a different domain name, set it appropriately there. The other settings are normally OK as default, except we'll scroll down and note the difference between this and the normal default.conf. This one has a lot of SSL directives. The SSL engine, which is used in HTTPS, is turned on. And a lot of uh, settings uh, for SSL. And these two are the ones really we want to change. I'll just scroll down. By default, this configuration file refers to these uh, template or fake snake oil certificates. Let's comment that these out. Uh, I did the wrong thing then. I'll just delete that. Snake oil. Uh, comment them out by inserting a hash at the start. We don't want them. We're going to add our own three in here. And again, it's important to get these correct. SSL certificate file is the first one. And we're going to refer to our three files that we put into the etc SSL directory. etc SSL, first one, certs, and the web server certificate. cert www.example.com.pm. Double check, okay? SSL certificate file, there's no typos or spelling mistakes, and it refers to that exact uh, file. If you have a mistake here, most likely when you reload the Apache to, to support HTTPS, it will not work. This is the most likely place that you'll make mistakes. That's where I make them. Next one, certificate key file. This refers to our private key. And private key, priv key, www.example.com. PEM. And the third one refers to our certificate authorities certificate. CA certificate file, etc, SSL, certs, cert, our CA.CRT, which is just the, the CRT and the PEM are exactly the same format here. It's just a tradition that the server will uh, refer to a .CRT file. So really, there are, uh, we add the server name in this configuration file. 
document root, other logs are all the same, the default values are su sufficient. Comment out the two snake oil directives and add in three directives, directives, the certificate file, certificate key file, and CA certificate file, referring to our web server certificate, our web server private key, and our CA certificate. And that's all the changes we need in this file. We'll escape and save. And now what we do, if we go back a directory, remember there are mods, modules available. We need to enable one of those mods or modules and Apache has a command to do that. And as a pseudo, Apache 2 en enable module and it's called SSL. Gives us some output saying we should restart Apache for this to take effect, but we'll do that in a moment. There's a couple of other things first. We need to enable that site, default SSL site. If we look inside sites enable, there's one site enabled, the, the normal default.conf for plain HTTP. We want to, as sudo Apache 2, enable site default dash SSL. It says to reload the configuration, but if we look inside sites enabled now, it lists both of those sites. If you wanted to add another website for a different domain, then you could have a, a third configuration file or multiple configuration files and you would enable them as well. Now we want to reload this configuration. Apache, when we make changes to the configuration, they don't take effect until we reload them. You can either re restart the whole server or simply reload, and we can use system control to do that. Reload Apache 2. If you want to restart the web server, it's simply restart Apache 2. In this case, it wouldn't matter. It's preferable to reload because you don't interrupt existing connections or existing people accessing the server. And hopefully that prints nothing as an output. If it prints some error messages or some output, most likely you've got some syntax errors in your uh, default uh, SSL.configuration file. Now we want to test. Apache should be up and running. And I'll switch to my client. Let's just check, I can access normal HTTP website. Yes, I can get there. I'll queue to quit, yes. Now I'll change the URL to say HTTPS and try and access using HTTPS. Let's see what happens. Lynx reports an error, SSL error. The certificate is not trusted and it doesn't show me all the message. Do you really want to continue? And it's suggesting no, well, yeah, I trust the certificate. I'm. What could be happening here is a man in the middle attack. Uh, and we'll see how to overcome this in a moment and what the problem is. I'm going to press yes to continue. And now I have access to the web page. And I'm using HTTPS. You could confirm in other ways. So HTTPS is working. The web server is set up. It's all OK. But we do have this problem with our web browser when we try to access our www.example.com, the web browser reports an error saying, I've received a certificate, but I can't validate that certificate. I can't verify it. And that's because the browser is not configured to be aware of our certificate authority. Uh, normally, browsers are configured by default to be aware of common certificate authorities. In a real network, I would get my web server certificate issued by a common certificate authority and we wouldn't have this error. We get this error because I created my own certificate authority. So next we'll go through the steps for overcoming this error. Just to be clear, the error is with the client. It's not any problem with the server setup. We need to make the client, the web browser in particular, aware that our CA can be trusted. And to do that, 
we need to get the certificate from the CA onto the client. And the certificate is on the server. I go home. The file we want is this one, cert lca.crt. We need that on the client and set up in a special way. So back to the client, what I'm going to do is copy that certificate from the server to my client. And on the command line, I can use SCP, secure copy, where I specify the IP address of the server, 192.168.2.22, followed by the exact path where my certificate is stored and the name of that certificate. Be careful in your case, your uh, username is probably different. So make sure you give yours uh, as the correct path. So that's whatever the value of this is on the server. So we're saying securely copy from 192.168.2.22 the file slash home slash Stephen slash cert lca.crt CRT and don't forget copy it to this directory on my client don't forget the dot there it's needed ask me for the password for Stephen at the server I type it in and it copies it and now I have this the CA certificate on my client computer now I need to set up my uh, uh, browser or more, more generally in my operating system so it's aware of that certificate and what we'll do, we'll make a directory on the client. This is specific to Ubuntu Linux. Other systems would do this in a different manner. Create this directory under user share CA certificates called extra for some extra certificates. Copy our CA certificate into that directory. And now reconfigure this CA certificates, this, uh, this listing of all the CA certificates to read into the new one. And to do that, sudo dpackage reconfigure CA certificates, which is the, the software package that keeps track of certificates of CAs. We're adding a new one to that. And yes, we would like to trust some new certificates. And it tries and finds some. A lot are already selected, the ones which are currently trusted by Ubuntu, which come when Ubuntu is installed. There's one at the top, which is this extra one, which is the one we want. And I'll press spacebar to mark this, that one. Tab to OK, so that that one will be added to the trusted list. That's updating. And when your web browser, including link, starts, it actually looks at that list. So again, we'll run links, access our web server using HTTPS, and it immediately goes to the web page. There's no error saying we don't trust the certificate. So that's the, the behavior we want. And we're complete. We've set up. Uh, Apache web server on our 192.168.2.22. We've created a certificate for an authority and set up the authority. We created a certificate for our web server and that was signed by the authority. Then we set up the configuration for Apache to refer to those certificates. And the last step for the client was to get our operating system on the client to be aware of the certificate authority certificate so that there were no warnings or errors. We now have HTTPS working uh, in our internal network. To finish off, one more thing, uh, testing. Uh, we can use links here to test. OpenSSL is a quite powerful piece of software. It has a way to test SSL our HTTPS connections. So if you want to test, and I'll just make that bigger, there's the option of this S client, connect to example.com port 443. So this is saying use OpenSSL to connect 
to some server and this gives details of that connection, that secure connection. And it, if we scroll up a bit, we'll see that it shows us all the details about the certificate that was exchanged. That is, it, it was a certificate of www.example.com and it was issued by some certificate authority, CQ University. Uh, so we can see the details of the security exchange happening there, the details of the certificate, and the use of SSL or uh, more accurately TLS in there. So that's if you want to understand the protocol interactions with HTTPS. Then I control C to quit that. We've done a quick setup of uh, Apache. Uh, we haven't tried to explain too much about how certificates and RSA provide security. That is probably too much or outside of the scope of what we're trying to do of just setting it up but it's really beneficial if you can learn about RSA certificates and their security value to really understand what we've done in each of those steps. The Apache web server runs in the, in the background essentially, so it, it's running at the moment when we install it. Uh, we can change the status of it so we can stop it from running and so on, so we'll show you some commands for for viewing the status and changing the status of the web server. And these commands are part of system D and the command is system control or system CTL. And they can be used on other services as well, like the secure shell server. Uh, so firstly, and we to get the full information to make changes, we need to be sudo system control system CTL. And there's a number of operations that we can uh, um, do. First one, we can see the status of a current service, of, in our case, Apache 2. What's the status of Apache 2? And it gives us some information, and the first few lines, Apache 2 web server, importantly in green, it is active and it is running. So the web server is up and running, that's what we'd like to see in the normal case. And some other details about the processes, the amount of memory, and a little bit about the log of the server and we can queue to quit. So the status tells us about how it currently is. Uh, we can stop the server. And now check the status and we see it's inactive or dead. It's not running. And if I open up my client and try and connect, I get unable to connect to remote host. So my client cannot connect to the server because the server, Apache in this case, is not running. And as you may guess, um, we'll just go to the top. If we can stop, we can also start. It's back running again. So stop and start, and there's also a restart. Uh, that's useful if you want to refresh things. Um, we saw uh, previously there's a restart, which should stop the server and start it. And there's also a reload, which doesn't stop and start it, but loads, in this case, any reloads any configuration files. And that's especially important with Apache because if you change configuration files, those changes don't take effect until you reload them or restart them. Restarting would interrupt any connections. Let's say if someone was accessing your website at that particular in time, the restart would, uh, would, would cause those connections to be disconnected. Reload would not. It would just reload the configuration. Uh, some other things. Um, all right, when our system boots, is it going to, um, is Apache going to start? So we can check and it's talk about whether Apache is enabled or not. System control is enabled Apache 2. Gives a bit of a warning there, it's not a native service. Uh, it's using an older system, but the last line saying, yes, it's enabled. Enabled means that when your system boots, Apache 2 will 
start automatically. You don't need to manually start it. And that's normally what you want with a server. So if your computer goes down and comes back up again, the server, the software will automatically start up. You can also see if it is, is active as a short way to see whether it's up and running now. Active means it's running now, enabled, it will run when the system boots. Uh, if you don't want it to run when the system boots, you can disable. And is enabled, it's disabled. Okay, so if my system boots, and let's see, is it active? It's running, it's active, but it's disabled means if my system goes down and starts up now, Apache will not automatically start. Generally, we want it to be enabled. So we we'll enable. And let's just clear that and see, is it active? Yes. Is it enabled? Yes, that's what we want it to be. So we can use system control to change the status of our server, in this case Apache 2. Let's take a quick look at the Apache uh, log of the accesses. And to do that, uh, I'll use my browser to access our server several times. Uh, first, to make it a little bit more interesting, I've created a couple extra pages. So remember the the base directory for the website content is under slash var slash www slash html and the index.html page there is the default page for Apache. I've created a subdirectory called test and inside there I've got two files index.html which includes a link to page2.html and, and which comes back to index.html. So that's my website. If I go to my client and open that website using my web browser links and I'll go direct to the URL so I know the subdirectory is test and that takes me to the index page. Note that I typed in the URL of slash test. I didn't type slash test slash index.html. And it's standard for Apache and most other web servers. When you request a directory, I actually requested test forward slash. The web server will check if there's a file in there, the index file, index.html. And if there is, it will send back that page. Otherwise, it may send back a directory listing but it's normally that if there's an index.html, the web server sends back that, which is what's happened here. It sent back our index.html, which just contains a heading, a line of text, and then uh, go to page two. In links, I can use my up and down to go between links, but unfortunately there's only one link here, the yellow page two. To follow that link, I can press space or the right arrow and I press the right arrow and I follow the, the, the link. That triggered my browser to request page two and the server has sent that back and now I see page two and my index link in yellow is highlighted. If I press right key, I follow it again and I request index.html and it takes me back there. So I've accessed the website a couple of times I can queue to quit in links. And now we'll go to our web server and look at the log. And that's in slash var slash log slash Apache 2. And there are three different logs shown here. The one of interest is the access.log. Uh, the error log is when we um, when Apache starts up or if there are errors with the web server they'll be put in there and hopefully you will not need to, to use that but if there are problems with your web server you may look in the error log and the other vhost access log is used in, in uh, if there are different virtual hosts uh, on the system we want access.log which is just a text file and I'll open it in VI uh, it's a text file where each line 
represents an access to the web server. Every time someone accesses the web server, they send a request using HTTP to the web server. The web server sends back a response. Then one line is put into this log file to the end of the file. So we'll inspect one of those lines and we'll look at uh, the last couple of lines, the last three in our case. Uh, there are some of the early accesses. We'll just quit out of that. Uh, sorry. Quit out of that. And I'll just use tail to look at the last three lines of access log. They're the ones of interest because I know they're the ones when I use my Lynx web browser on the client to access the web server. There are actually three lines here, but because they're so long, they are wrap around. So this is the first line. This is the second line and the third line corresponding to three accesses to the website. Let's go through the first one. Uh, the IP address of the client that accessed our web server. These two are empty fields, so they're space separated fields in this uh, file, in this uh, entry, and they don't have a value. We will see later one of them is related to it. Well, we won't see in this demo, but uh, if you have logins, usernames and passwords, the username may be stored there. The next is the date and time that that request was received, and that's in square brackets here. So we know when that request uh, occurred. The next, and just be careful, it's in, enclosed in double quotes. This is the next field. This is the summary of the request that came from the client. The client said get slash test slash, because if you remember in links, that's what I typed in. Uh, I typed in open my browser access using HTTP www.example.com i.e. my web server and request the path slash test slash so that's what's sent to the web server and using protocol HTTP version 1.0 the server received that request and sends back a response depending upon whether it was successful or not. And HTTP has a number of status or response status codes. And the most common one we'll see is 200 OK when everything is OK. Another one you may see is 404 not found. So this is saying response was OK. This is the size of the response. The HTTP response, response was 428 bytes long. This field is empty, the dash, is the referrer field, we'll see it in the next two examples. And this long glass field is an identifier of the web browser, referred to as the user agent. Saying the web browser identified itself as links version 2.89, running with some options, SSL, GNU, TLS, and so on. So this was set by the web browser when it sent the request to the web server. So now the server knows something about who accessed and also what software access, what was running, what browser was running. But noting that a browser could potentially change that if they want to hide that detail. So this was a request for slash test slash. A, sent, a response was sent back 200 OK, including the web page requested, which we saw was the index.html file because of this feature, if you request a directory, normally the index.html file is sent back. Then about a minute later, I followed that link to page two. So we see similar information, but a request to slash test slash page two.html. And 200 OK, the page two was sent back. And note we have this referrer field set here where it wasn't set in the first one. This field, the referrer field, indicates uh, if we followed a link to get to page two, where did we come from? What page did we come from when we clicked on that link, which in this case was the original test URL. So to get to, to page two, we came from the original test. 
And in the third case, to get back to index.html, we clicked on that link to go to index. And if you looked in the source code, it would be a link to index.html, not to slash test slash. And the referrer in that case was page two. The referrer is useful to give statistics to the web ser server operator about where did someone come from to get to their website and how do they traverse through the web website. For example, if someone uh, visited your website via a link in the Google search results, the referrer here may be uh, a reference to Google. So you would know that to get to my website, they come via Google, and that can be useful information for the website operator. So a brief summary of the log file, the access log file, which is maintained by uh, the Apache web server which can provide useful statistics for operating that web server. Here we have three Linux machines set up in VirtualBox, uh, a client, a router, and a server. Let's learn a little bit about some Linux uh, networking commands, starting with ifconfig. My virtual network, or my uh, network between those Linux machines inside VirtualBox is shown in this picture where the client and the router are on some virtual LAN, net A, the router and server on a separate LAN, net B, and they've been set up and the IP addresses are allocated to different interfaces. There's also a NAT interface on each of those Linux machines so that they have real internet access uh, via VirtualBox and by my real PC. So let's look at the client first and we'll use ifconfig to uh, see information about my interface configuration. So my network interface configuration, when we run ifconfig on its own, it shows me the list of uh, interfaces which are enabled or, or turned on or referred to by ifconfig as up, up and running. And it shows there are three, ENP0S3, ENP0S8, and LO loopback interface. Uh, if we just change the font to be a little bit larger, we can see that in a bit more depth. Uh, and we can scroll through. So for each interface, ifconfig shows us some information about that interface. Uh, and we'll look at one of those in depth in a moment. Uh, we can pass in one of the interface names as an option. I have config ENP0S8. I know that exists and it shows me the details for that interface. So what does it tell me? Uh, we'll go through some of this information. It tells me this is an Ethernet interface. It has a, a hardware address or a MAC address of this particular value. And since we're using VirtualBox, that is actually assigned by VirtualBox. In a real uh, computer, that would be the, the address assigned to your Mac or your LAN card. We have an IPv4 address, an internet address, 192.168.1.11, an associated broadcast address, a network mask for that IPv4 address. In my case, these were set up when the machine booted from a different location. We can also manually set them using ifconfig and other uh, processes. I have an IPv6 address, although it's not a global address, it's a link local address and that's been allocated automatically. We're not going to touch IPv6 at this stage, we will at, at a later stage. A bit of information about the status of the interface, it is up, up means it's, it's turned on, it's running. Uh, it supports broadcast, multicast, uh, and it has a maximum transmission unit of 1,500 bytes. Some statistics about how many packets have been received and transmitted on this interface, collisions, a queue length, and the bytes received and transmitted. So some basic information about your interface and some statistics can be obtained using ifconfig. When we run ifconfig, it shows all up interfaces. In the man page for ifconfig, it's got several options. 
and we can read through one of them. We'll use commonly as minus a. So I have config minus a shows us all interfaces, those that are up and also down. Now in this case it is no different. All of my interfaces are actually up, but if there were some interfaces which were not up, which were down, then they would be shown when we use ifconfig minus a. So we can use ifconfig to show interface configuration. We can also use it to change interface configuration. As for example, we can turn an interface uh, up or down. I'll just clear that. I have config ENP0S8 is my one of my interfaces. If I want to turn it down, I can type the option command uh, down. Noting that if we want to make changes to the network configuration, we'd need to have administrator rights. So I'll proceed that with sudo and ask for my password, which I have. And now I run ifconfig. It lists ENP0S3, which is up, my loopback interface, which is up, and it doesn't list ENP0S8, it's down. If I add the minus A option, all, it does include ENP0S8, and it's not listed as up and running here. Whereas the first one was up, here we don't list up, so ENP0S8 EN is down, it's not turned on. We cannot use it. We can turn it back up, as you may guess. It's now up and running. So we can turn an interface off if we don't need it, uh, and turn it back on if it was in, originally off. You can also uh, make changes to the addresses used by the interface. I'm currently using the address 192.168.1.11. We'll clear that. We can change the interface configuration of ENP0S8 and we can check, set the address, let's say 1.12. And I should specify the net mask. And it's good practice when you change the address to make sure the interface is up. It's not needed, but I'll include it at the end to, to say, let's, if it was down before, let's turn it up. If it was up before, then it makes no difference. And we note that we've now changed the IP address of that interface. So we can change the configuration of the interface using ifconfig as well as view basic information. We will see if we go to our router. There's just another quick example. I have config on the router. Quite simply, it shows us that we have three Ethernet interfaces, the NAT interface, and then it's because it's a router on network A and network B, it has ENP0S8 and ENP0S9 and different IP addresses. And the loopback interface is for testing purposes, normally for communicating with yourself, to send to yourself with the the local loopback address of 127.0.0.1. So ifconfig is a quick way to view interface information and to make changes to the IP address for your interface. Let's take a look at the routing tables inside Linux and we'll use the command route to view the routing tables and to edit the routing tables. So route on its own shows the routing table for the current machine. So I'm running on my client at the moment. I run the route command and it shows me my routing table. And it, the table in this case has three rows or three entries into it. And we'll explain that in a moment. Uh, first thing, with a lot of the networking commands, route and others, they will show the results in a try to be a human friendly form versus the, the raw form. And the human-friendly form uh, often will convert, attempt to convert IP addresses to domain names and maybe present a, a, a simple um, name rather than the actual IP address. And that's okay sometimes, but generally when I'm looking at uh, the network setup, 
I would like to see the raw IP addresses. And with a lot of networking commands, route included, if you add the minus n option, it shows you the raw or the numeric values rather than the human friendly values. And if you understand enough about IP addresses, it's probably sufficient to look at the raw values. So you'll often see I use the minus n option with some commands without explana explanation. It's not all commands, route is one of them. The difference being, instead of writing default here, the human friendly name, it gives this special all zeros address. And here, instead of star, it's got another all zeros address. So I'm going to use that minus n option. I'll do that again, route minus n. For my cl client, it shows me a routing table. And the two, two first columns are very useful. They say, in order to reach some destination, send to some gateway or router. Gateway is another word for router. So if I want to reach a particular destination, and it's usually not one destination, but a subnetwork, then send to a particular router. The others uh, are useful, but those first two, if you can understand them, them that's uh, maybe the most important. The mask goes with the destination. Then there's maybe some flags like whether the route is up and whether we use a gateway, U and G. Uh, some measure of um, the, the cost of using that route, how often it's used, uh, and in maybe the other most important is at the end the interface that we use. The reference is usually not used. They are described further in the man page for route. Describes, of course, the, the commands in depth, the options, and gives some examples, and describes the output to see the different flags and so on. So, in our network setup, it is like this. We have a client, a router, and a server. So across two different uh, internal subnets, both, uh, all three of those Linux VMs have a NAT interface which connects to really VirtualBox, which then connects them out to the real internet. So let's have a look at the routing table for my client. Three entries. What's the first one say? This four zeros destination is a spe special value not with respect to IP networking, but with respect to this route command. What it means in the destination column is that uh, it's like star, meaning matches any value. So, and, and the way that routing tables are used is the, the longest uh, prefix match. So the, the most, the, the closest match of these three destinations will be the one that's taken. You can often think of this as the default route. If the others don't match, then if it's all zeros here, then it will match definitely. So this is the default route saying if there's any destination which really doesn't match the next two, then send to a router 10.0.2.2 and use interface ENP0S3, which if we look at our network diagram, from the client, if we want to send to a destination which doesn't match the next two, which we'll come to, send to 10.0.2.2. Although it's not shown on this picture, that is actually the special IP address that VirtualBox uses. 10.0.2.2, you think, is here. This is the VirtualBox internal router. And use ENP0S3. Let's look at the other two routes and then come back to that one and we'll see why it makes sense. And we'll go to the bottom. If we want to reach network 192.168.1.0, anyone that starts with 192.168.1, and we know it's a, uh, subnet, a network address because this is the mask that goes with the destination, although it comes in the third column, you think it goes with the destination, then send to no gateway. I read this as. Don't send to a router. If we don't send to a router, then we, the only other option is to send direct. This is saying, 
If there's anyone on 192.168.1.0, we don't need to send to a router, we can send to that, uh, direct to them via the LAN, because this is the same subnet as what we are on. In our picture, network A is the network 192.168.1.0. The client and router are on that network. That third routing table entry was saying anyone else on that same LAN, we don't need to send to a router, we can send direct to them. If there was another computer connected to network A, 192.168.1.53, the client would send direct to them, not via router. So there's no router or gateway in that case. That's what the all zeros mean in the gateway column. Similar in the second entry, anyone on 10.0.2.0, send direct. And this is using interface EMP0S3. And this is really the network between the client and VirtualBox router. Not shown here, but there's actually, VirtualBox creates its own network for the, uh, between that client and this router interface. If you want to send, send to 10.0.2.2, for example, send direct to them, don't send via router. And then we read the first row and think, well, if it doesn't match 192.168.1.0 and it doesn't match 10.0.2.0, then it will match this, meaning anyone else. Anyone else send to 10.0.2.2, which is our VirtualBox router would send to here. And if the destination was the real IP address out on the internet, then the router would then forward it on the real destination. We have a bit of a problem. We should have our network set up such that if client wants to send to 192.168.2.22, it should send via our router. And at this stage, we don't have that route present in the client routing table. It's been deleted. I'll add it in a moment to demonstrate how to add a route. But let's just look at the server and the server routing table. I'll just change the fonts a little bit larger. This is the server. So from the other endpoint, the server, which is on the subnet 192.168.2.0, network B, it also is on this special subnet 10.0.2.0 and can send to the VirtualBox router at 10.0.2.2. And the server should be able to reach the client on 192.168.1.0. Let's have a look at its routing table. Starting from the bottom is a good way to read this. Because the routing table is not processed in order, it's based upon the longest match. Uh, I'll look at the bottom one first. To reach anyone on our subnet, 192.168.2.0, send direct. That's the fourth row. Send via S8. To reach anyone on 10.0.2.0, also send direct and send via S3. The second row and the fourth row are really for matching. If there's someone on network B, send direct. If there's someone on this special network between us and the VirtualBox router, send direct. And there shouldn't be anyone else there in our setup, except the VirtualBox router. So that's the two directly attached subnets. And we'll often see when we're directly attached to a particular subnet, we'll have such a route. The first, or well, the third one now, if anyone is on an 192.168.00 subnet, send to 192.168.2.2 via S8, and this is via a gateway or a router. How does that work? If the destination is a 192.168.2. Uh, something, then of these four destinations, the closest match is the fourth one, and we'll send direct. Even though 192.168.2.something matches the third one, 
the fourth entry is the closest and that's how the routing table works it uses the the, the longest matching uh, prefix the closest value so if the destination is 192.168.2.something send direct if it was say 192.168.1.something then the fourth one obviously doesn't match the third entry is the closest match and we'd send to the gateway 2.2 .2. And that's, that entry is the one that allows our server to know about getting to network A. If we're at 2.22, the server, and we want to send to say 1.11, 192.168.1.11, then the destination 192.168.1.11 matches the third row, and it tells us to send to router 192.168.2.2, which is the router in the middle, we would send our packet to the router. The router would then do its lookup and direct the packet on, forward the packet onto the client. So that's the routing table entry we need to reach that other subnet. And that's what we, we need to add an equivalent one to the client to get it to work. And the first one is for any other destination, which is not a 192.168 anything and is not 10.0.2 anything anything else will send to the virtual box special router 10022 and that will go out to the internet in most cases our default route so what do we do to add a route to our client to get uh, our fourth entry such that if the client wants to reach 192.168.2 or something, network B, we should send to the router 192.168.1.1 via interface ENP0S8. We want to add a route, route entry for that. So let's do that for the client. And to change the network configuration, we need to have admin rights or use sudo. We use the route command, but with some options. We want to add a route. and the destination network 192.168.2.0. Let's all right, and let's keep going. And net mask, which is actually the the third column in our table, two five five two five five. What should it be? Let's go back to our uh, our desired setup. We're saying to reach one nine two. 192.168.1. something, so I've made a mistake already, that, and we're using a net mask of uh, 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 slash 24. Let's go back and fix my mistake. It's not. Sorry, we're on the client. That is correct. Let's be clear here. We're on the client. We want to reach network B, 192.168.2. something, then we add the route to that destination network and the gateway is going to be 192.168.1.1 so the net mask is a slash 24 and the gateway 192.168.1.1 the router IP address and we say what interface do we use what device ENP0S8 and that is referring to from the client's perspective which interfaces it's going to use to send via. So let's have a look at that command. To add a routing table entry we use route add, destination network, that's the destination column, 192.168.2.0 and the subnet mask 255.255.255.0 which is the third column and the gateway 192.168.1.1 and the device and we need password and we've added that and I'll use our routing table to show that that routing table entry is there so that's how to add a routing table entry uh, 
if we compare our client, and that should work, and how can we test that it works? We can use ping from our client and try to contact our server, and we get a response. So our communications is working, suggesting our routing table is working well. So we added this row here. If we compare, and it works fine, it's fine. Uh, if we compare it to the server, the server was slightly different. This row was to 0, 0.0. Let's go back and explain that and see the meaning of this. We're saying from the client, if we want to reach 1.0, send direct. If we want to reach 2.0, send to 1.1 for the internal networking. A more general approach would be to say, if we want to reach 1.0, send direct. If we want to reach any other subnet, which starts with 192.168.0.0, send to the router. Now, that's not necessary in this case. It uh, was included in the server to cover the case where if we extended beyond the server, for example, we added network C over here, or in the other direction, uh, a network D over this way, then the routing table entries would still work. So that's why we see a slightly different routing table entry between server and client. But both of them work in this simple internal network. If we did want to delete a particular entry, it's almost the same as adding, use the same values, but DEL. And it's gone, and I'll add it back in so our network works. So we can add and delete routing table entries uh, to see more options on manipulating the routing table and viewing more details. Have a look at the man page for route. Uh, and that allows you to do some basic configuration of your internal network so you have an internet with correct routing tables. We've got three Linux machines, a client, router and server inside VirtualBox set up in a small internet. Let's have a look at the command netstat on those machines and we'll see the different options that this provides us. Netstat actually provides many different uh, sets of information, network uh, connection information, network statistics. We know that ifconfig, for example, shows us statistics for a particular interface, simple things like receive bytes, re uh, receive packets, and so on. Netstat has uh, a number of different options or modes. Minus I mode shows us interface information. So similar information to ifconfig, but in a tabular format. But Netstat shows us other information. For example, we know the routing table can be viewed using the route command, the minus N to show the numeric addresses. Netstat has a, Netstat has a minus R for routing table information and it's identical information to the route command. So as, as the case with Linux, a lot of times you can do the same thing or similar things using different tools. And that's because of historical reasons. Uh, people have developed different tools to do similar things. They have different trade-offs. Uh, so that information we've normally seen. One other, another useful option for Netstat, and clear that, is to show statistics of the TCP IP stack. And that just prints out statistics. And if I scroll up and, and show you those, it shows IP statistics, packets received, IP packets received, internet control message protocol statistics, ICMP like ping messages, uh, different message types, and then TCP and UDP transport layer statistics. Uh, and this will change as you run your machine and, and there's different communications taking place. TCP segments received, sent out, UDP packets received, and some extension information about TCP and IP which are not included by default. So if you want to see information about packets sent, then netstat minus S is a good starting point. So as we've seen, Netstat has different modes like interfaces, routing tables, statistics. If 
we look at the man page, you can go through and read about those different modes. So the routing table, interfaces, there's other things like groups, masquerade uh, for, uh, for network address translation, statistics. And the other useful one is to see TCP and UDP connections or sockets. Let's have a look at that. Netstat minus T for TCP minus N for numeric addresses. This shows active TCP connections. Ongoing or established in this case uh, that my client is involved with. And importantly it's showing that my IP address 10.0.2.15 which is my NAT interface and port number 22 which is my secure shell server has an established TCP connection with 10.0.2.2 and port 34735 and a second uh, connection also with a secure shell server. So with netstat minus T we can see uh, current connections to our server or connections from our or from our uh, uh, machine out to other servers. And this is useful if we're running uh, TC, uh, secure shell servers, web servers and other servers on our machine. You can see the servers that we're running or that, that we're listening on using a minus L option. This is saying that my machine has a server listening on port 22. It also supports TCP oh, or IP version 6, which is the second row there. But this one is saying uh, I've got a secure shell uh, server waiting to receive packets on port 22. If I was running a web server, then maybe I'd have another entry on uh, listening on port 80. There's a similar option for UDP communications, although that's recorded at slightly different. And in my case, I have nothing happening with UDP, so there's no uh, interesting information shown there. So read through the NetStat man page and try some of those options to view information primarily. The minus T option, minus U a common, routing table if you don't want to use the route command, interfaces some additional information and the statistics. And if you scroll through it explains a lot of the information included in the NetStat output. Let's have a look at uh, the address resolution protocol in Linux. So we have three Linux machines set up, a client, router and server, all inside VirtualBox. And the client and router on one LAN and the router and the server on a second LAN, Net A and Net B. And the address is uh, 192.168.1.0 for Net A, 192.168.2.0 for Net B. Dot 11 for client, dot 22 for server, and 1.1 and 2.2 for the routing interfaces. When a uh, machine wants to talk to another machine on the uh, same LAN, assuming it knows the destination IP address, for example, client wants to talk to router with address 192.168.1.1, then it needs to know its corresponding MAC or hardware address. And address resolution protocol is the mechanism for discovering that MAC or hardware address. In the basic approach, a client, when it knows the destination IP address, it broadcasts a message on the LAN saying who has this IP address, and the router will receive it, and the router has that IP address, 1.1, and will send back a response saying I have this IP address and my MAC address is this value. The purpose here isn't to explain how the protocol works, but just to see how the command can be utilized in Linux to see some information about what's happening in the background. Essentially the protocol runs in the background on each machine. In the Linux command line, if we go to our client, we have a command called ARP, which shows us the current mappings that this machine knows about. I'll use the minus N option to show the raw or numeric values, not the uh, host names or domain names. So from the client's perspective, it currently has an ARP table with two entries. There's two rows. And what it tells us is that the client currently knows that the IP address 192.168.1.1 has this hardware or MAC address. 
the 08 address. And that's known because it's learned in the parts. So ARP is working in the background to update this table. On the Linux command line, we often just use this table to see the current values. And my client knows to use interface EMP0S8 to contact 192.168.1.1. To contact 10.0.2.2, it will send to this other hardware address via the S3 interface, which actually corresponds to sending the VirtualBox router to send out to the internet. So the ARP command shows us the current uh, values that it knows about. If I communicate with another node, 192.168.2.22, the server, and I ping and I stop that, I just send three pings, they communicated, and now look at my ARP table. Then in this case, there's nothing different because 192.168.2.22 is on a different subnet. So in order to communicate with the server, the client actually still sends to the router. So therefore, to send to 192.168.2.22, the client must send to 192.168.1.1, and he already knows that MAC address. So the point here is that the ARP table, ARP is local to the LAN. Communicating with nodes outside of that LAN, ARP uh, doesn't have a role in, that's part of routing. And our routing table tells us if I want to reach 192.168.2. something, like the server, I would need to send to 192.168.1.1 and I already know the hardware address of 192.168.1.1 to send to. So ARP is used inside the local LAN. Uh, we can manipulate the ARP uh, table. Normally we would not, we would just view it. You can, if you look at the man page, you can see that there's a number of different options and one of them, the minus D option, is to delete an entry from the ARP table. And note it requires uh, privileges to do that. And you can also set up a new entry manually using the minus S option. But in most cases ARP will uh, do this in the background for us. We can do delete. We need sudo to get an administrative rights. And by us manually deleting, now the table, it's aware of some 192.168.1.1, but it doesn't know the hardware address. If I now ping 192.168.2.22, I still communicate and look at the ARP table. When I tried to contact some other node on another LAN, the routing table told me or told my client to send to router or gateway 192.168.1.1. Previously, my client didn't know the hardware address of that corresponding IP address, so ARP works in the background to discover that hardware address, and then it was discovered, and that allowed my client to send to the router, which then forwarded it on to the server. So ARP allows us to view the routing table and also, in some cases, manipulate that routing table. I have my uh, Linux machine, my client, uh, inside VirtualBox. And let's have a look at doing some DNS client operations. And we'll use NSLOOKUP to basically see the mappings from domain names to IP addresses in the internet. Normally this happens in the background, but we can uh, have a command line tool to to inspect things ourselves. Uh, currently it's not installed, so I need to install the DNS utilities. DNS utils is the package which includes the things that I want to use, in particular NSLOOKUP. It may be installed on your system, in mine it's not. So it's going to install some additional packages and, and use about 12 meg of disk space, so that's why it's not installed by the cut down server initially. Yes, I'll install. And now I should have 
and just to show by installing DNS utils, I should have the command I'm looking for, which is nslookup. nslookup uh, does a manual lookup if we provide a domain name, for example, uh, google.com.au, it does a lookup. Uh, and it tries to find the corresponding IP address and it finds the answer is 216.58.199.67. The purpose here is to explain how the domain name system works. It's to show uh, what NSLOOKUP does for us. Normally DNS runs in the background, we don't do this. For example, when I open my browser and type in a domain name, like Google's domain name, then it calls a DNS client to do the lookup for us. We're basically manually calling the DNS client to, to do the, the lookup using the program NSLOOKUP. So it gives us a mapping from a name to an IP address. You may see different information uh, because DNS, DNS is a complex system where we have uh, may have multiple mappings, we have uh, caches and that may mean that people in different locations or on, uh, on different computers can get different responses. Just looking at the output of NSLOOKUP, the first two lines are not telling us the result but telling us the server that we got the answer from. So basically we ask this particular server 138.77.176.10 uh, and that may be given as a domain name there in some cases and here would be the IP address and port 53 which is the port number used by DNS servers we ask this server what is the IP address for this domain name and the answer we got back was this 216 address and it's a non-authoritative answer meaning the answer we got back is like a cached value it's not coming from the authority server where this domain name is registered. So uh, it may be different in different cases um, and it may be out of date because it's a cache failure, but normally it would be uh, a correct. Try it on different domains. Uh, you can type sandylands.info and it tells us the, the IP address for that is 103.363.107. Uh, we can, um, and it tells us that we got it from the same DNS server. And that DNS server would be my local uh, DNS server for the, the university network. Try a couple of others and let's look up on Facebook. Some different output here, again we've done a lookup, we've got an answer, uh, but we see that there's that Facebook or www.facebook.com uh, is really an alias or a nickname. The real name or canonical name is star.miniC10r.facebook.com and the IP address given is for that domain name. So this is saying that Facebook is just a nickname for this, this longer domain name. And again, the complexities of DNS means you may get different results depending on which regions you're in, uh, which DNS servers you ask. Uh, a couple of others. Google.com, not .au, gives a... Sorry, if we do and compare. Google.com, this 216 address, 199.68 and do google.com.au.67 almost the same 67 68 uh, most likely they are uh, as both hosting Australian web server content although it's more complex than just uh, going by the IP address and we can as another option I'll just clear we can specify which DNS server to look up so when we just so Sorry, when we type 
type just the domain name, then we'll ask our default DNS server, but we can supply as another parameter uh, a known DNS server. And I know that there is a DNS server with the address 8.8.8.8, .8 which is actually the free DNS server that Google provides. So in this case, I haven't asked my default DNS server, I've asked a, a specific DNS server, this 8 all 8's address, and I've got the answer from that server. And noting it's a different answer. Okay. So uh, different DNS servers have different mappings from the same domain to uh, IP address. And you need to look at the, the background of DNS and, and how, uh, say, websites have um, content in different locations and uh, to understand how all that works. So use NSLOOKUP to do manual lookups for domain names and optionally supply a, a DNS server that you want to ask to get the answer from. We have our uh, three Linux machines inside VirtualBox and set up in an internet where we have a client and a router on one LAN, net A, with network address 192.168.1.0 and the router and server on a second LAN, net B, 192.168.2.0. Let's have a look at ping, communicating between two nodes to test for connectivity and test uh, uh, delay. And so I'll use ping to communicate between the client and server, noting the server has address 192.168.2.22 and the client 1.11 and we need to go via the router. So I'll go to my client and we'll use ping. Ping triggers internet control message protocol messages to be sent, ICMP messages of a certain type. And the simple way to use ping is to specify the destination you want to ping, 2.22 in this case, on, on the client. And what it does is it starts this ping which by default every one second sends a ICMP echo request to the destination and the destination will receive that and send back an ICMP echo reply and for each second each reply we get ping prints out a line here showing us some details and it keeps doing that every second so every one second it's continuing, it's sending an echo request to the server and the server's getting back a response. And it'll go forever. To stop it, control C. And when we do control C, it lists some uh, statistics, some summary statistics at the end, which we'll have a look at in a moment. Sometimes we don't want to go forever, so we can specify a count with a minus C option. Let's ping three times to the server. And it stops, in this case, after three pings. So just looking at the output here, what is it saying? Uh, the top line is a summary of what's happening. We're doing a ping to 192.168.2.22. If we had a domain name, like we're trying to ping www.google.com, it would show the domain name and the IP address here. This is something about how much data we're sending. So what ping does is, it's not about communicating data, but the echo request includes some dummy data in it, and in this case, 56 bytes of dummy data, creating an echo request of total size of 84 bytes. There's some header information. And then we send that request every one second, and in this case, we get three replies and a line was printed each second for each reply received. We received 64 bytes from the server. The ICMP echo reply was containing sequence number one. The time to live, or TTL, indicates the number of routers we go through. In this case, the initial value was 64. Every time this message goes via router, it's decremented by one. So 63 means this message has passed by one router. And the time is the round trip time. The time from when my client sends until it receives the reply. So to get there and back, 0.276 milliseconds. Then it did it again and again. The summary statistics, number of packets transmitted, received, no packets lost, the total time it took to do that ping, 
And then the round trip time, which is these three values, the min, average, maximum, and essentially mean or, or standard deviation in this case. The minimum was 0.276 milliseconds, max 5.847. The average is calculated and a standard deviation. So we can get some summary statistics when we have multiple pings. Uh, some other options, we can specify the interval by default every one second. We can set it to send every two seconds. You see a slight more delay there. Every two seconds it prints out a result. So we can change the interval using the minus i option. And we can set the size of the data being sent to be 100. So send three pings, a count of three, interval of two seconds, two seconds between each ping, and the size of the data, 100 bytes, instead of the default 56 bytes. And 108 bytes come back because it's 100 bytes plus eight bytes of uh, extra header information. And there are other options with ping. If you see the man page, you can see the many different options that ping has. Uh, so ping um, can be used to test network connectivity. If we can ping another node then or another computer, then it means we generally have basic connectivity with that or IP connectivity with that computer. So when I ping from client to server, I know I can communicate with server. Uh, it tells me on the path between the source and destination the number of routers I pass through based upon the time to live, the TTL. I saw 63, I knew that was one less than 64, meaning one router it passed by. And importantly it tells us the time to get from client to server and back, the round trip time. So it can give us some information about delay. So we use ping for testing ne network connectivity connectivity and, and measuring delay. We have three Linux machines inside VirtualBox, the client, the router and server, and they set up in a small internet. And the server is set up to be running the Apache web server. So it has a, a website on it, the de default uh, Apache website. We're going to use the client as a web browser and explore how we can modify the host file to give some fake domain names, just for testing purposes. So I'll go to the client, and in terms of web browsing on the command line, I'm gonna use Lynx as my web browser, which is a text-based web browser, and access the server, which has IP address 192.168.2.22. So this should take my client to the website of the server in this case, and we'll just press enter, and we see at the top, this is the Apache 2 Ubuntu default page. So this is provided by default when Apache is installed on the, the server. So this is the website. And I'm going to queue to quit. Yes, I'll quit. Now, we don't have a domain name for our uh, web server. And we're not going to set one up this stage because in our internal network we're not going to go to the complexities of having a, a DNS server or registering a real domain name. Uh, but sometimes for testing purposes I would like to uh, give it a domain name. So instead of having to type 192.168.2.22 I'd like to type in a domain name. And in the host file, and I'll just show that, the host file inside a, a Linux machine it contains local mappings of names, including domain names, to IP addresses. And in my host file, I have a mapping which I've put in there before that demonstrates that if I want to go to, if I type in the domain name www.example.com, it will take me to the address 192.168.2.22, which is that of the server. Let's just try that. So the idea is if I now type in via my browser links, I want to go to example.com, then it takes me to that same Apache 2 Ubuntu default page. It takes me to the server website. Cue to quit that. 
because what happens is that I supply this domain name and what my uh, uh, DNS client does is it looks in this host file to see if there is such a domain name and it finds on this third line there is a domain name that matches that and therefore it says contact the IP address 192.168.2.22. If there wasn't a value in there, then for example, it's not in the host file, then it uses the real D DNS system. Uh, so if it's not in the host file, and that's just some cookies that Lynx is asking me about, then it does a normal DNS lookup, goes out to a real DNS server and finds the IP address for www.google.com from, from the real DNS server and eventually redirects me to the real Google web page. I can queue to quit. So by default what happens, the, D, the NS or the DNS lookup first consults the ETC host file if there's no match in there, then it consults the real DNS server. How do I know which real DNS server? There's a resolve.conf file which keeps track of the DNS servers or the name servers listed here. So my real DNS servers, I actually have three configured, uh, 138.77.176.10 and these other two. Noting that this file is generated by some other software in the background, we normally would not modify that. That's the Resolver uh, software. So again, when I supply a domain name to a client, such as a web browser, the host file is consulted. If there's no answer there, then the DNS server, one of the DNS servers is consulted and we get the, the real IP address. That allows us to put any domain names in the host file. So, once again, if I access Google, I get eventually, I accept the cookies and I get the Google website and I queue to quit. Now, if I edit the host file and we need administrator privileges, I'll open it up in Vi, so we sudo Vi. And if we insert a new line saying, I'll read this backwards, the domain name www.google.com maps to the IP address 192.168.2.22, that is my local server. Then when I try to visit google.com, I should be redirected to my local server. We'll try that, I'll escape and save. Now I'll do the same, access the Google website, and it takes me directly to my um, local server showing the Apache 2 Ubuntu default page. This is because the first check is done inside hosts. So now my client thinks that www.google.com is actually my local server and it's a way for me to use that domain for testing purposes um, and for do some simple redirection. Noting that the host file is local to my machine. Right. So whatever I put in here is only relevant to my client. If I then go to, uh, let's say, my router, another Linux machine I have, which has a different host file, if I uh, try to access, say, if I ping Google, then it will go to the real Google website. So the host file is only for making changes local to the machine. So it's no good for setting up uh, domain names across a network. It's just internally to that machine. And just to be clear, I'll go back and edit my host file and delete that line and save. And now when I access google.com, since there's no entry in the host file, it should take me to the real Google website because my real DNS server is consulted to get the answer. So use your host file to uh, test different domains when you have a local server. 
uh, and maybe to do redirection if you don't want to go to the real website.